Generally accepted wisdom is that sequels are never as good as the original, like Ghostbusters 2 or Chet Hanks. Sometimes, though, a sequel will come along that is so good or innovative or just completely different to the game that preceded it that it will totally revitalise the franchise, saving classic game series from being consigned to the scrap heap of history. Join us then as we salute these fantastic follow-ups, the Colin Hankses of video games. What? He was great in Fargo. But we're minor spoilers ahead for the following games. Uh, that thing you do as well, he was in that, he yeah. was good. Or, did you see Orange County? I, I didn't. Was he good in it though? I, I remember him being quite, quite, quite good in it, yeah. Jack yeah. Black's in that. Jack Black, oh, Jack Black's good, isn't he? Yeah. 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 Catherine O'Hara's in it as well. Catherine O'Hara. Yeah. But the thing I like most about Colin Hanks is his Hanks-ish quality. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, he's, got, got, he's got it in spades. He's got that magnetism, hasn't he? Yeah, the Hanks, the famous Hanks magnetism. The Hanks gene. <laughs> if it wasn't for me, you would have died on that street corner. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't have been in a goddamn coma. But I guess that makes us even. Not really. In 2006, developer Volition asked the question, what if we took Grand Theft Auto, copied it exactly, but crucially, made it a bit worse? And the answer to that question was the original Saints Row. That's the great thing about this city. It's there for the take it if you've got what it takes. The game itself was a functional crim sim, but you can tell how hard it was trying to be an authentic gangland story by how much swearing everyone was doing. Man, f*** that. I'll take King out. Johnny, it's not that simple. Bullets still kill mother right? Doesn't get much simpler than that. Keep an eye on your boy. I don't need a babysitter, Julius. Even Quentin Tarantino would be like, bit much. Appearing in a GTA-less vacuum on the brand new Xbox 360 definitely helped Saints Row 1 punch well above its weight, selling around a million copies. Unfortunately, it's not a trick that would work twice. By the time Saints Row 2 appeared in October 2008, GTA 4 had been out for almost exactly six months, and there's no way Volition's scrappy underdog could ever have matched Rockstar's open-world crime epic in technical prowess, grittiness, or frames of bowling played with your cousin. Nico, you're pretty good. It's clearly those bellic jeans you've got. Fortunately, Volition clearly recognized this early on and took Saints Row 2 in a different direction, prioritizing over the top fun rather than trying to tell a convincing gangland tale. Would you rather go bowling or steal a septic truck and spray loads of sewage on pedestrians? That included making the gangs more caricatures than actual serious street gangs, adding ludicrous side activities like spewing sewage all over the place, or throwing yourself into traffic for the insurance money. <sighs> it's tough out there on the streets. Since Saints Row 2, the series has doubled and tripled down on this wackiness in increasingly ridiculous entries. There was the spin-off that saw the Saints descending into Hell, or Saints Row 4, which made the leader of the gang the President of the United States and eventually, most dramatically, blew up planet Earth entirely. And if you're wondering why it's taken eight years since Saints Row came out for them to announce a follow-up, it's because they were trying to work out a way of topping all that. It's fair to say that the Saints Row series has truly stepped out of the shadow of Grand Theft Auto and become a classic open-world franchise all of its own. And these days, the games have almost nothing in common with GTA. Well, I guess you can go bowling. Let me show you some. Oh, that's way better. I've got to give Roman a call. Sometimes, in some really rare occasions, you'll find the second entry in a franchise is the one that really nails the formula. The Godfather Part 2, The Empire Strikes Back, Step Up to the Streets. You'll have to trust me on that one. That was absolutely the case with Street Fighter 2, the all-conquering 90s fighting game that was so popular and ubiquitous that it was easy to forget that there was a Street Fighter 1. And it was bad. Alright, there's no denying that the first game in Capcom's series introduced a lot of the concepts that contributed to Street Fighter's ultimate success. The three rounds of one-on-one -on -one combat, the special moves and iconic characters including Ken and Ryu, albeit a Ryu wearing a pair of bright red slippers. And from the way he's frantically hopping around, it looks like there are a few sizes too small. 
Unfortunately, the combat was janky, the artwork was kind of goofy looking, and the deluxe version of the arcade cabinet used a unique and uniquely rubbish pressure pad system to determine the power of your attacks. Also, this is a game called Street Fighter, and most of the places you're fighting aren't even streets. That's a temple. That's a rail yard. That is clearly the Great Wall of China. Come on, it's like you're not even trying. Compare it to the worldwide best-selling sequel, Street Fighter 2, which featured more fluid, predictable movement, beautiful and varied pixel art characters, and spectacular special moves. It's hardly surprising that by 1994, the game had reportedly been played by 25 million people and was cemented as a genre-defining classic. Still barely any streets, though. Confusingly, if you wanted to fight in the streets, you'd be better off playing Capcom's other game, Final Fight. Although that wasn't even the final fight. There was a Final Fight 2 and 3. Sort your naming conventions out, Capcom. What have you been up to, Blasco Heads? Shoot. Stabbing. Strangling Nazis. With Wolfenstein 3D, the venerable granddaddy of the first-person shooter genre, the announcement of a new game in the series should always be reason for excitement. Besides, if absolutely owning Nazis ever goes out of fashion, we're in real trouble as a society. <laughs> yep, still feels pretty good. Whew. But with Doom following closely after Wolfenstein 3D, there have actually been very few main series Wolfenstein games, and often huge gaps between them. In fact, it took a full nine years for a proper official sequel to Wolfenstein 3D to arrive, return to Castle Wolfenstein, by which point it's fair to say technology had advanced significantly. I mean, Castle Wolfenstein actually looked like a castle, for a start. Return to Castle Wolfenstein was extremely well received as a shooter on PC in 2001, but despite strong review scores and decent sales, it would be another eight years before the series returned. That was with 2009's unremarkable Wolfenstein, which received lukewarm reviews and uninspiring sales figures, firmly cementing the Wolfenstein series as a relic of a bygone era of FPS games, with no relevance to the age of games like Borderlands or Call of Duty Modern Warfare, due to, it has to be said, the unforgivable lack of 360 no-scoping. <laughs> I, I hope this war never ends. And so the Wolfenstein series lay dormant for five more years, and you'd be forgiven for thinking that that was it for the adventures of BJ Blazkowicz, and that the series was as dead as Mecha Hitler after a machine gun to the face. Eva, I'll be the then. Which is why 2014's Wolfenstein The New Order was such a massive surprise. Not only was it a new Wolfenstein game with the same setting and main character, but it was also really, really good, with some excellent writing, a gripping, twisty story, and impactful choices for you to make, and some of the crunchiest, best-feeling gunplay this side of Destiny. Wake up. You're dead. And there were some truly fun and bizarre gameplay sequences, including one bit where you got to run around on the moon, where the low gravity makes it much easier to get a 360 no-scope. All at once, Wolfenstein came roaring back to life and was established right back at the top of the FPS tree, spawning a prequel, a sequel, and its own spin-off, starring BJ's daughters, Wolfenstein Youngblood. But they fear the blood running through your veins. The blood. Blaskowitz. Not bad for a series that was all but dead in 2009. Well, I guess it is pretty hard to kill BJ Blaskowitz. Head trauma, four inches of cast iron shrapnel right in the conk. Still in there. Ain't taking nobody up to the fort in a long time. Strange place for a decent fella to want to visit, if you don't mind me saying. Who said I was a decent fella? The name of a video game has two jobs. One, to sound cool, and two, to describe the game. Red Dead Redemption knocks the first one out of the park because there are fewer combinations of three words in the English language cooler than this. On the second job, that of describing the game, we give the name a C+, because thematically it is all about redemption, and you do make a lot of guys dead in it, and the box is red? So I guess it basically works? Of course, Red Dead Redemption makes much more sense as a name when you recall this 2010 game is the follow-up to Red Dead Revolver. In that game, you had a special revolver, and you made a lot of guys dead with it, and crucially, the cowboy protagonist was, in fact, called Red. It's so simple, unlike the history of Red Dead Revolver itself. Red Dead Revolver was published by Rockstar in 2004, and developed by Rockstar San Diego. 
But the game started life four years prior under the watchful eye of publisher Capcom, back when Rockstar San Diego was called Angel Studios because Rockstar hadn't bought it yet. Red Dead Revolver was cancelled by Capcom, then resurrected by Rockstar when it took over the studio and impressed Dan, Mr. Rockstar Hauser, even in its unfinished state. You might want to start with Pig Josh. He's one crazy outlaw and circus freak. These origins account for the relatively low-key rockstariness of Red Dead Revolver, it being a rootin' tootin' action game without the telltale sprawling cinematic ambitions and painstaking open world of a modern rockstar joint. Damn, son! <laughs> You done killed them all! On the other hand, it was Red Dead Revolver, as the predecessor to Red Dead Redemption, that established the franchise's distinctive dead eye mechanic. And it also gave us dead eye duels, setting us up for a Red Dead gaming future of painting our opponent in panicky slow motion. Red Dead Revolver was moderately well received in its time and is a fine action game, but it could have easily gone quietly into that good night and been forgotten like so many other basically fine action shooters before it. Say, you're new in town, ain't you, stranger? You ought to have a look around and see the sights while you's here. Except along came Red Dead Redemption in 2010 to blast the cobwebs off the Red Dead series, giving us Rockstar's fully formed take on the epic western with Deadeye and an open world, and a similarly scarred protagonist by a different name. It was John Marston and his tale of attempted redemption that elevated the series above its spaghetti western action origins to nigh on universal acclaim. So, Red Dead has him to thank. Although, they should have called it John Dead Revolver. I'm only holding you to your own logic, Rockstar. In 1997, a time when most RPGs were Tolkien-esque fantasy featuring at least eight different types of elf, the Fallout series of RPGs was revolutionary. Swapping the storybook vistas of high fantasy for a grim and desolate post-apocalyptic wasteland, Fallout was a breath of stale, possibly irradiated air for the RPG genre. And the only pointy ears would be if you were halfway through mutating into a horrific human-sized rat monster. The two original Fallout games collected something of a following thanks to their bleak tone and dark humour. The only problem is complex RPGs aren't necessarily the most accessible of genres, limiting its audience somewhat. And after Fallout 2 in 1998, a third game in the series ended up in development hell for so long that its publisher Interplay went bankrupt. That left the door open for Bethesda, best known for the Elder Scrolls games, to swoop in and make a more mainstream Fallout. That game was Fallout 3 and released in 2008, at which point the series had been dormant for 10 years. Fallout 3 swapped the top-down perspective for a full first-person sandbox, with hundreds of voiced characters, varied side quests, and, to keep track of your moral compass in the unforgiving wasteland, a subtle and complex karma system. Lost Karma. Interesting. We can imagine it was upsetting in some quarters of the hardcore PC RPG fanbase to discover that their beloved top-down cult classic had been turned into oblivion with guns and power armor. The rest of us were too busy firing portable nukes at terrifying super mutants to care. Tell me again about how traditional turn-based combat and tiny 2D sprites are really exciting. It certainly resonated with players, with the game selling an estimated 12 million copies. And the series was rejuvenated, leading to the brilliantly written Fallout New Vegas, the expansive Fallout 4, and that was all the Fallout games. Hang on, wasn't there a Fallout- ALL THE FALLOUT GAMES! Anyway, Bethesda, you might want to pencil in another one of those series-saving games sometime soon. Just a thought.
Flight Simulator 5.1 offers endless flying variety with over 200 airports to choose from with spectacular true-to-life landmarks from all over the world. These days, Microsoft Flight Simulator is one of the most technically impressive and technically demanding video games there is. Thankfully, I bought my gaming rig just six short months ago and it cost me £40,000, so I should be able to run it just fine. My rig! If you do have a setup that can run it, a high-end PC or an Xbox Series X, Microsoft Flight Sim is a popular and truly impressive bit of software. A one-to-one, -one, stunningly realistic recreation of the real world, an opportunity for virtual tourism during a time when travel is highly restricted, and of course, a stark reminder of just how bloody complicated it is flying a Boeing 737 airliner. 747 is type Boeing B748, 3 miles northwest of Dubai, 1,800 feet. Request clearance to transition Charlie airspace. Which one of these is the button that orders the Bloody Mary and starts a Fast and Furious movie? Going back to the series' roots, however, it wasn't always apparent that Flight Simulator would become the genre-defining standout hit that it is today, due to the technology just not being where it needed to be to make an impressive flight simulator. As you can see from this footage of the very first game in the series, FS1 Flight Simulator for the Apple II, in which the aim of the game was to keep a white line in the right place and try not to fall asleep from boredom. And for the early years of Flight Simulator, this was very much the norm, as we can see from this footage of Flight Simulator 4. It's come a little way, there's some colour now, but fundamentally, it's the same snooze-inducing situation. How come I can never fall asleep on actual flights, but can't stay awake during this? What came next, though, was to change the series forever. Flight Simulator 5, released in late 1993, was the first game in the series to use actual textures, which made things look like things, rather than, for example, weird lines in the sky. And because previous games in the series were built in the Weird Lines in the Sky engine, it meant that everything had to be redone for Flight Simulator 5. There was no reusing of areas or aircraft, the entire thing had to be overhauled, which dragged the game to the forefront of technology at the time and started Flight Sim's reputation for being the best looking, most technologically advanced, most realistic flight simulator in the world. With its stunning, realistic looking scenery, you get the same bird's eye view you would if you were really there. This is a reputation that endures to this day, as we can see with the astonishing flight simulator on Xbox Series X and PC, a game so detailed and realistic that I can fly by our actual studio and probably see myself through the window. Uh, that plane is actually getting quite close, though. Pull up! It, right, Which, right stick down! Right, what do you mean right, it's right stick up? It's no, 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 I change, I've changed it to the other, I'm not inverted. What the hell? Rise and shine, sleepyhead. It's time for supper. Who are, who are all you people? Where's Mia? Edith, it's good. Dumb some bitch wasn't no good if it hit him. <laughs> yeah. The world loves a good redemption story almost as much as it loves a good Resident Evil game. Which makes 2017's Resident Evil 7 a satisfying double whammy of giving the people what they want, in that it both redeemed the troubled, seemingly deteriorating Resident Evil series, and was a fresh, terrifying, brilliant Resident Evil game. And if you happen to love hand trauma, well, it checks that box too. What's that you don't? Oh, I have some bad news. It's about your hands. The grimy first-person horror of Resident Evil 7 was a big, wild swing from the franchise, stepping away from the familiar zombie-dodging heroes of the long-running series and punting tormented everyman Ethan Winters hands first into the mix. You're not listening to me. There are crazy people in this house trying to f kill me. <laughs> but the big swing paid off. With its found-footage horror vibes and high-fidelity grisliness, Resident Evil 7 was a new Resident Evil for a new age. And to put it in the context of the previous 10 years of the Resident Evil series, it was a radical much-needed course correction over the likes of Resident Evil 5, which was a middling, action-heavy, problematic slog, and Resident Evil 6, which introduced characters so forgettable that I instantly forgot about them. Wait, what? You could be the key to saving this world, Jake Mueller. I'm looking at them right now and they're sliding right out of my memory. Pierce! No, don't do this! Open the door! Sorry, who are you again? But just as absence makes the heart grow fonder, the long years without a great Resident Evil game made Resident Evil 7 all the more delicious. And of course, fans of hand trauma owe a particular debt to Resident Evil 7, which walked so that Resident Evil 8 could run all over your hands. Well, that's gonna make the game harder. 
Hey, we're here at the end of the video. Thanks for watching. We made it. Uh, if you want to watch a sequel to this video that is be it, as good or better, I won't say it is better, it might not be, but it could be. And the only way you can find out is by clicking on these, the sequels to, the, to this video. It's a whole cinematic universe. Here is a video from us. Down here is a video from Outside Extra. Both extremely good. Uh, they're very much the Colin Hankses of this whole scenario. So enjoy those and we'll see you next time. Bye.